Can education save civility in our country? As we see polarization on both sides and the lack of a conversation going on, we need to go back to civility. And today's author and podcast guest, Lexi Hudson, tells us how to do it. So without further ado, let's jump in. Classical Conversation Studios presents Refining Rhetoric with CEO Robert Portens, a podcast where faith, business, politics, and classical education meet. Join us as we use the classical tools of rhetoric to seek truth in every arena of life. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Refining Rhetoric. Today, my guest is Alexandra Hudson. Lexi is an award-winning journalist, author, and speaker. She's also the founder of the Civic Renaissance, a newsletter and intellectual community dedicated to moral and cultural renewal. Her first book, The Soul of Civility, Timeless Principles to Heal Society and Ourselves. You should go pick it up. Released this past October. We're actually doing a giveaway for several copies on The Soul of Civility on our social media, so stick around to the end of the episode to hear more about that. Lexi, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rob, for having me. Thrilled to be here. I'm a big fan of Classical Conversations. Oh, thank you. Um, So how did you come about writing The Soul of Civility? And tell us a little bit about your background and your family. So two important things about my background that led to two reasons why I wrote this book. One, I was raised in a intellectually omnivorous home. My parents are both highly educated, you know, highly credentialed and traditional academic institutions, but they always modeled for us that learning was a way of life. Education was a lifestyle and that it was something that didn't actually necessarily happen in a classroom. And often classrooms were inimical to the project of of curiosity and and lifelong learning that, that true education was about. So they raised us just to approach life with with wonder and curiosity and, and, and interest. And that was really a defining facet of my upbringing that I'm so grateful for. It is really the, the, the life well lived, the curious life, like living as if every opportunity, every experience you have, every person is something to teach you. And I'm so grateful for my parents for um, teaching me that. Second, that's uh, relevant about my upbringing, that's relevant to why I wrote this book, is that I was raised by my mother, who is called Judy the Manners Lady. She is an internationally renowned expert on manners and etiquette. She teaches manners and etiquette to you know customer service corporations at a big level and also to kids. She has a whole album for kids um, teaching music to song, um, to song uh, manners to, to songs rather. And um, she is unbelievably other-oriented, gracious, and kind and hospitable to the stranger growing up. Um, our home was a revolving door of newcomers to our community, immigrants, uh, homestays, and she just really was is passionate about about manners to the end that they support the human social project and flourishing with with others in community. But my mother, in addition to teaching us you know, and modeling for us curiosity and hospitality and, and true civility, she also taught my brothers and I to mind our P's and Q's, how to set the table, how to cut our food, how to hold our forks and knives. I am constitutionally allergic to authority. I hate rules. I hate being told what to do. To this day, if someone tells me to do something, I'm like, I want to know why. I want, I want to know their the just, justification, the underpinning. So even though, so, you know, being being raised in this home of, of rules and propriety, I always wondered, I hungered for the why behind what we do and, and why we do them. Was it just that some, you know, self-appointed authority at some time decided that we should do it this way? And if that's the case, like, is that the best way? Should we should we continue it? Is that, you know, is tradition alone a reason to, to continue a certain norm and propriety? And um, so all that to say, that those are two um, facets of, of my background that are relevant to my work. My mother taught me, you know, to, to, to mind my P's and Q's. She promised that that doing so, the, the ways of, of, of politeness would, would serve me well in, in work and school and life. And she was right until I found myself at the United States Department of Education. And I was, um, I got to the U.S. Department of Education and I was utterly disillusioned and dispirited pretty much from day one. Two things that that were most discouraging. One, and this ties back to the first thing I talked about, about how I was raised in a very intellectually curious home. You know, I went to the U.S. Department of Education hoping that this was, I, I thought this was my big break, you know, it was a career break of a lifetime. I thought I might have the opportunity 
to shape America's education system for the better, at least in a small way. And also, I'm passionate about education. I love learning. And I was devastated. That's why I went to the Department of Education. And I was devastated to learn that the United States Department of Education Department of Education, the single largest institution in the history of mankind dedicated to student instruction, doesn't actually care about education. At least not how I had been educated, how I think many, you know, you and many, I mean, your audience might might understand education, which is lifelong learning, beauty, goodness, and truth. <laughs> now, how many of those, I, you know, thinking back, how many of those people like were married and had kids and were planning on like raising a family was a significant portion of the Department of Education actively involved in raising their own kids, or was it kind of a hit um, or miss? It's, a, it's a good question. I'd say many of them had families, um, but for many of them, it was just a job, you know? And this is kind of a really interesting facet of an, an irony in, in being at the United States Department of Education, as, as, as I'm sure many of your audience knows, the Latin root of education is educare, which means to bring forth or to lead out. And that's one thing right. that was so disillusioning about being at the United States Department of Education is that I was boxed in. I was confined. Instead of being brought forth and let, let out, I was asked to sit in a windowless office for a year of my life and be a body in a chair, not think, not ask questions, um, just, just fill out my timesheet, be in the body in a chair, take my paycheck and go home and be content with that. And I had career civil servants, like people that I worked alongside, who had hidden calendars behind their desk. And they would cross off every day that they were at work. It was one day closer to retirement, to when their life right. could truly begin. And it's like, what a way to live. I, that was just a really early formative experience of what I didn't want out of life. I didn't want to just you know, be a body in a chair and just you know, exchange time for money in that way, not, not exercising my faculties, my mind, my curiosity. I had a similar experience. I was co-oping and uh, at uh, at a big you know, top fifty company in uh, in manufacturing. And my boss retired. He ret got an early retirement package two two uh, two years early. And he took all the his very last day. Like they had a party for him and stuff like that. But his very last day working, um, he went out to lunch. All the interns and co-ops took him out to lunch. And, uh, you know, he asked for him to give us some words of wisdom. He said, well, 12 years ago, I realized I hated my job, but I figured I'd already given 17 years to it. So I would just tough it out until the end. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> like, I, you could tell he wasn't super engaged with the work, but to have that mentality is just such a sad thing. And the, the antithesis of human flourishing, of a civil life. It's such a great story. Yeah, it, it's it's very much uh, an ethos of of our modern world right now, which I, which is something I'd love to return back to um, later in this conversation. That the reason we do education the way we do it is for the convenience of parents who work conventional nine to five jobs and gets two weeks of vacation a year, and so much of our education is glorified childcare for that reason. And that's you know happy to talk about this later. About this is why I'm. I'm, I'm like, I'm basically homeschooling my kids right now. Um, they're one and a half and three and they're on book tour with yep. me for the next six months. And I don't know if I'll ever put them in school because I've worked really hard to like move away from that box life. Like I'm not a box person. I, I, I failed right. out of department of education and other conventional jobs where I was asked to be in a box. And like, I, you know, my parents raised me that learning was a way of life and I want to raise my kids that way too, that raised on the school of life, like raised by experience and, and empirical observation and in love of, of, and wonder. Um, one time I was at a um, meeting with with some career staff at the Department of Education, and I was like utterly dispirited, but I thought, you know, I'd, I'd try to – and I one thing that was so frustrating is that I um, was I was desperate to meld what I loved, which was, you know, classical ideas, philosophy, and, and, and what I knew really well with right. the world that was the, and the world I was in, which is modern, you know, public policy, bureaucracy, government. And I just struggled to find that connection. It just felt like everything I had learned my entire life had no relevance to what I was being asked to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So one time I tried and it was in a meeting and it was like before the meeting had started, I tried to do that. I said, I said, I just kind of mused out loud, hoping someone might, you know, pick it up and run with it. <laughs> I said, you know, 
Plato had a lot to say about education. You know, he he conceived of education as as soul craft, you know, ordering of our loves and our passions, where wisdom rules our passions through our courage, through thumos. I said, you know, how might that inform what we do here at the Department of Education? This like very <laughs> traditional notion of of education as soul craft, ordering passions, ordering loves. Mm-hmm. And just like blank stares, crickets, like people looking at me like I had just grown like I don't know, a third nose or something. Like, are you insane? Yeah. Like, and someone like cleared their throat <laughs> and started the meeting. Like, <laughs> it was just so, so funny. And like, not mm. to disparage them, I just don't think that they'd, they'd ever heard of maybe Plato before or like hadn't thought about that before. It's like they just did what they were asked to do, you know, move point A to point B, move, you know, move money from Congress to state districts, you know, states and yeah. states and local districts. And um, without a lot of critical thinking or a, lo- a lot of, a lot, without a lot of big picture thinking. And so anyway, that's, that's one facet um, that, uh, of what was very disparity about, about government. And the other facet relates to, and that relates, that, that relates to the book, but also another facet as well. But. Well, of course we would encourage you to homeschool here at Refining Rhetoric. Um, but uh, one of the things that homeschoolers get hit with Often and less so now that homeschooling has gone more mainstream is this like, well, what about socialization? And, uh, you know, some of it was early on in homeschooling wasn't even legal in all 50 states. Like you were literally possibly have your kids taken from you or fined or go to jail or go to court. So that was part of the reasons why, you know, we weren't exactly that social early on, at least in the 80s and early 90s uh, before homeschooling was legal everywhere. But I've come back to this question is like animals can be socialized. We want our children to be civilized. So that you're you're asking the wrong question. It shouldn't be what about socialization? It should be what about civilization? What about becoming a civilized adult? I uh, I mentioned this interview I had with Jonah Goldberg earlier this week. His uh, and where my kids escaped my mother, her supervision, and like interrupted my my, my podcast, uh, interview and it was mortifying and it was, it was, he was so gracious. So it, was, it ended up being fine. Uh, and he's, yeah, he's this popular podcast called the remnant, but you know, it's funny. I listened to a few of his episodes before, um, I was, I was interviewed by him and it, it's almost like every other episode he likes to quote his favorite quote about why he, about that informs his entire worldview is a quote by Hannah Arendt that says every single, um, generation is overrun by barbarians. And we have to civilize these barbarians. We call them children. <laughs> so like, and I thought that was so funny that he, you know, he was joking like, yep, we're, we're being overrun by the barbarians as we speak. But I think that that, I think that fits well your point, not to socialize, but to civilize, to, to cultivate our humanity, our humaneness, and, um, and not, not just, you know, acculturate us, but like, you know, elevate us, ennoble us, humanize us as the, as the purpose of education. It's a great point. Yeah, my great, uh, my father-in-law ca- calls my youngest. He's uh, three and a half. Uh, Jonah the Destroyer. So I, I, again, uh, the whole barbarian thing makes a lot of sense right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, we want to we want to have civilized adults. So, like, what inspired you uh, to write this amazing book that uh, that uh, you've shared with the world? I know it's based on decades of your experience and, um, you know, your life growing up. So why did we need a book on civility? So this gets back to the second reason why I, um, uh, was very disillusioned, discouraged by by government uh, and my time in, in, in at the Department of Education. I saw firsthand the profound division in our world right now. I experienced it um, viscerally. Um, when I was in government, I saw these two extremes. On one hand, there were people who had sharp elbows. They were bullies. They were people who were willing to coerce, you know, twist your arm to, um, to, to, to get whatever they wanted, to get ahead, step on, step on anyone to, to gain their objectives. Right. And on the other hand, I saw this second contingent that at first I thought they were my people. They were po- people who were polished and poised and polite. But these are the people who would smile at me and others one moment and stab me in the back the next. And that perplexed me because one thing my mother had said to me growing up was that manners mattered because they were an outward expression of our inward character. And yet Mm -hmm. yet here I was surrounded by people who were well-mannered enough and yet ruthless and cruel. So this disconnect between inner and outer 
really perplexed me. It threw me for a loop. This experience taught me several things. One is that these two extremes, they seem like polar opposites, the extreme hostility and abrasiveness and bullying and the extreme politeness. They seem like right. they're very different, but they're actually very similar. They are they are two sides of the same coin. Both modes instrumentalize others. They see other people, other human beings as means to their selfish ends as opposed to beings who are worthy of respect in and of themselves just by virtue of the imago dei you know the imprint of the divine the dignity we all have and share as human beings and that's how i define civility the bare minimum of respect that we are owed no to others by virtue of our shared humanity and dignity so they they seem like polar opposites actually very similar because the 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 the, the bullying contingent sees others as willing to bull over step on to get ahead and the polite right. contingent sees others as pawns to be manipulated in order to get what they want. These these two extremes also are emblematic of the two extremes in our modern life, our modern public discourse, uh, where we have the that the tone policers, the ones that want to suppress and silent, like don't don't talk about you know that's that's controversial, and and then the people who want to elevate a strong man to puncture. That 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 pretense of politeness and hypocrisy, like you know, we need we need people who are willing to get in there and speak hard truths, and and they so they want to correct for this extreme of like you know faux politeness, but they're mm -hmm. actually going to another extreme, another excess, which is just as dehumanizing and just as harmful to modern democracy and and human flourishing. This experience also taught me uh, this that there's an essential distinction between civility and politeness. That politeness is manners, it's etiquette, it's technique, it's external, it's behavioral. Right. Civility is internal. It's it's a disposition of the heart. It's ordered loves. It's seeing others as a bare minimum of respect, uh, as beings worthy of a bare minimum of respect, just by virtue of our shared moral status of the human as the human community. And it's restraining ourselves. It's considering others alongside ourselves uh, for the sake of human flourishing and and the human social project for democracy as well. Crucially, sometimes actually respecting someone requires being impolite. It means telling a hard truth. It means engaging in robust debate. That That's actually a way of loving, of respecting mm -hmm. someone, not papering over difference, not polishing over difference. So this, because this is classical conversations, I think you'll appreciate that the etymology of these two, two ideas supports this distinction. Because today, people use these words interchangeably. There's a contingent that says, you know, we just, we're so divided, we just need more, more civility and politeness in public life. We just need, you know, hark they harken right. back to this golden age of comedy, a comedy. On the other hand, there's this contingent that says, no, civility and politeness are part of the problem. They are tools of the people in positions of power to keep the powerless powerless. And we need less civility and politeness in modern life in order to have social progress and, and, and gain social equality and social justice. And yet both these contingents miss this essential distinction. So politeness is – the Latin root is polier, which means to smooth or to polish. Mm -hmm. And that's what politeness does. It papers over difference as opposed to giving us the tools – to grapple with difference head on. The Latin root of civility is civitas, which is all things related to citizenship, citizen, and the city, and also civilization. And that is what civility is. It's the conduct befitting a member of the city, of the city um, the conduct befitting citizenship, and the habits of citizenship that, again, often require telling hard truths, engaging in robust debate, doing things that seem impolite but are deeply respectful and essential for human flourishing. Hey everyone, I want to take a quick break to tell you about a product that we love at our family, Scribblers at Home, recipes from lifelong learners, and it's full of step-by-step -step activities and things you can do with your family covering art, math, history, Latin, and much more, and it's really about intentional play, and whether you're in a classical conversations community or not, Scribblers will bring joy to every learner in the family, no matter what age. It would be a great Christmas gift for your own family or maybe a family that you love. So go visit classicalconversations.com forward slash scribblers. That's classicalconversations.com forward slash scribblers to get yours today because the best gifts are experienced together. Now let's get back to the show. That's that's wonderful. And, you know, her human flourishing is really something that's that I value because for me, 
you know, as Christians, uh, if you are on this planet, we are the closest to hell we'll ever be. And anyone who is not a Christian, if they are uh, on this planet, this is as close to heaven as they'll ever be. And kind of our responsibility as Christians is to, well, try to help them to the other side, uh, but do so in a way that represents, you know, our King and uh, our future, our future home where we truly belong. So I think getting to this soul of civility is vitally important to our culture because if we keep going down this path, like you're saying, you know, it, it's not going in a good direction. But I also wonder this idea of this is an idea that I've been wrestling with. So I want to take your get your take on it. You know, we've we've got the left and the right in this country, and when I think of that, it's like okay, well, the left and the right were kind of pointing at the same goal, right? This idea of you know America flourishing, uh, you know people this American dream idea. And now it almost seems like there's not a left and a right anymore because there's not a shared vision or shared goal for our country. So do you think that has anything to do with our society's lack of civility and continued, um, you know, we just see extremism rising uh, really in, in all facets of life? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. We see this rising, apocalyptic rhetoric on both the political left and the political right. And you're right that not only do people of opposing parties n not share a vision of the good, but they don't even agree on the means of of our democracy anymore, the means of de de deliberative democracy. And like they they don't agree on on the on how the institutions were designed to play out. And, and protect us from the worst aspects of ourself. And, and increasingly, we hear people justifying, you know, suspending the rules of 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 um, of our of our democratic way of life in order to justify winning and beating the other side. And what's interesting uh, is that people insufficiently realize that, and, and so we hear this, you know, nice guys finish last and you have to be willing to, willing to take the gloves off and do and say anything to win. The other side is mm -hmm. so bad, so morally wrong, so evil, such a threat to my identity, my existence, that they don't deserve respect. And it's it's worth noting that it's it's when the stakes are high that it's most we're most inclined to dehumanize the other, right? That's when we feel justified. We want to feel justified and vindicated in being willing to do and say anything in order to win and, and to get ahead. And that is problematic for, for so many reasons. And it's it's when we, the stakes are high in, in, in elections that seem really important in times of war. That's when we need to maintain the dignity and humanity of the other, even those we differ with, even those we disagree with, even those that we can do not, who can do nothing for us in return. That's when we need to keep their dignity front and center most. And so what people insufficiently appreciate today is that when they're cr crying, you know, own the libs and, you know, just, you know, beat the enemy, whatever it is, that they don't, when, when we're in civil to others, it doesn't just hurt others. It obviously does. It obviously degrades the dignity and humanity of the other. But it also hurts ourselves too. I mean, Socrates understood that virtue was its own reward, a well-ordered soul, a just soul that act just that acted justly in the world. That was good for its own sake, but it was also its own reward. It uh, it was health of the soul. And vice a vicious soul, the symptom of which is um, viciousness towards others, cruelty, injustice towards others, that was its own punishment. So people who walked around malicious and cruel and hurting others in life, they didn't deserve our, they, our disdain. They deserved our compassion because whether they realize it or not, they're suffering. And they're 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 living in a in a, in, a, in a with a sick soul, and um, and Dr. King understood this too, borrowing from Socrates in his letter from Birmingham Jail. Dr. Martin Luther King said that the same about segregation. That that segregation obviously hurts the segregated by giving them a false sense of inferiority. It also hurts the segregator. By giving them a false sense of su superiority, it deforms their soul. He said, and this is exactly where I get my title, the soul of civility, from. Because just as incivility is mutually 
harmful and degrading and dehumanizing, right? When we're cruel to another human being, we don't just hurt others. We become less human and and less humane. Like our soul is harmed in the process. But just as incivility is mutually harmful, civility, acts of charity, grace, compassion, hospitality, kindness is mutually ennobling. And so incivility is, is its own punishment. Civility is its own is its own reward. Well, I do agree with that. And I think that mirrors the teaching of you know Jesus and what we see in the Bible. You know, if someone sins against you seven times, no, not seven times, seven times, 70 times. In other words, infinite, <laughs> infinite amount of times uh, per day were to forgive them. Um, <clears throat> one of the things you say is how do we flourish across uh, deep differences? Like, let's talk about, I don't know if we want to maybe go here, but like, let's talk about, say you're a sitting president and the other side is just creating lies about you, getting people to lie about you, and the news media is just running with it 24-7. And so you're you're punching back. What would you what would you suggest that they do? Like how would you try to create more civility or defend yourself? Like if CNN was just saying Lexi Hudson was a Russian spy. 24 seven and had 50 FBI agents sign letters saying that you were, and it was just completely made up. Um, but everyone knew it was made up, but they were running with it. Uh, how would you respond? How would a civil person respond to that? Yeah. It's really interesting that on one hand, I did not write my book with the intended audience of public leaders. Sure. I, I wrote it for everyday Americans. I wrote it for people who are frustrated with our divided status quo and and the vitriol and hate and toxicity in our public life and who hunger to be a part of a solution and feel helpless. Like I hope that people who read it come away with an appreciation of the power that every single one of us has as, as citizens to be a part of the solution in our everyday. So to answer your question, I wrote this book for – for public leaders to the extent that they are individual public individual citizens <laughs> first right. and foremost that they're that they're people first and foremost and my message to to them in that context would be you know you can't control what other people do it's the same message that is throughout my book this sort of like pro, proto stoic message that you can't change the world you can only control you and that you choosing to be different can change the world. So part of the story I tell in the book is that when I, I I call myself a refugee from federal government, I fled the U.S. (laughs) Department of Education. I I came home from work one day and said to my husband, I am done with Washington. I'm done with this city, um, done with this job. Let's move to Indiana. That's where he's from originally. And um, he said, okay, done no take backs. <laughs> and so a few months yeah. later, we were out there and we've been there for five and a half years. And so we moved to Indiana and we didn't have many friends at that point. Um, and a woman came up to us after church one day and she said, hi, I'm Joanna Taft. Would you like to porch with us sometime? <laughs> and I had never heard the word porch used as a verb before, but curious, I Uh, We went to her home that afternoon, and I realized that Joanna is staging a quiet revolution from her front porch, a revolution against Mm -hmm. our divided and atomized, isolated era of of, of utter despair for many. Like We hear about these deaths of despair, and she's creating community, and she's creating this little oasis on her great big front veranda um, where people across difference, like she had curated people on her porch across race across ethnicity, uh, across um, class, across geography, across politics, just to not to have a structured conversation across difference, but just to inhabit a shared space and feel seen and known and loved, which is all we hunger for deep down and most, and which we often don't get in our age of isolation and digitally mediated um, connection. And the hope is that, you know, people might one day through their, um, through these, through this, these, um, just share, sharing a space with people across difference, build, build seeds of trust and, 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 and friendship that might allow for healthy conversations across difference. That's part of the problem we're enduring right now is that we lack that basic trust, that basic respect and affection and friendship that is 
not allowing us to do life together across difference well at all. We're only talking about the hard things and we're only assuming the worst and we're deeply uncharitable in how we're doing life together. And you need that friendship and trust that allows us to give the benefit of the doubt to people that allows us to do life together well. And and so what Joanna taught me is that she realizes she can't change the world. She can't single-handedly, you know, pull a magic lever and transform our American public life. And she can't control who's tweeting what, what the scandal of the day is, what what who's in the White House, but she can control herself. And she, in small ways, she's trying to make her community better and her family stronger. And we can too. I, I traveled the country as part of this book project and when I was a Novak journalism fellow. And I found and talked to people and I reported on people who were choosing to be part of the solution in, in their every day. They said to one another um, – they, they 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 gathered people at a coffee shop on 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 the, it's not even about the porch right like it's about a disposition the disposition of civility it's respecting others seeing them as human being first absent of these labels that our culture today assigns inordinate value to and says I'm going to see you I'm going to know you I'm going to love you and I'm going to invite you into my fold and um you know I, I, on my coffee shop in a coffee shop on on my on my front lawn on my front stoop it's it's not about the porch it's, it's a way of engaging in in the world as, as wanting to transform the outsider to the insider the stranger the friend and so that porching revolution that I talk about in the book it will heal our broken world and in the book I outline specific ways how we can do that too. Now, we want people to pick up the book, obviously, um, but what are one or two of those ways that like individually, okay, I want to be more civil, like sometimes I'm embarrassed how I act on social media or something like that, but it's kind of hard when, you know, the other side's doing X or Y or, you know, I think both sides realize that we don't send our best best to Washington. Um, (laughs) I wish we could agree on that and then say, okay, well, then let's make Washington less powerful in our lives so we don't have yeah. this civil civil issue. I mean, we cannot, but uh, it seems like the centralization of power in our country is, in my opinion, causing some of this divide. Because the stakes are higher, right? What Washington does is more important. The more centralized power is there, the stakes are higher. And if the stakes yep. are higher, people are willing to do and say more, you know, in order to win. That's yep. It's a great point. For homeschool parents who want to raise civil children or for an adult who sometimes might feel like they let go of themselves too much, what are some like top two or a couple of ideas that they can dive deeper in? Well, in my book, I unpack why and how specifically the classical model of education in, in homeschool context and in public school charter context. Like I, I feature a public school charter school to show that this this can be mainstream. Like in my opinion, homeschooling should be more mainstream than it is. But that that um, this this model of education, this classical model, can be applied in in in, in mainstream public education today. I, I feature the Great Hearts um, Academies that and and show how this this model of education that sees education as it has been seen across history and culture as soul craft, ordering our loves, making making it th- through habit and through example, Natural. It's not natural for us to put others before ourselves, but that's what civility right. requires. That's what life together requires. That's the dual commandment, right? Like love God, love others. That's an, that's Augustine's um, theistic view of ordered loves. Right? He's a Platonist, so he was borrowing from from Plato this idea of of soul craft, and he was a, a great proponent of the liberal arts and the humanities for that for that reason for for the purpose of ordering our loves. And that is what. We need more than ever. We need to have a educational system that is explicitly value laden. Our education has to be value laden. It has to be explicitly, unabashedly pro human. And this is part of the problem with with education today. They're afraid. They're, we're afraid to to have values in, in, in public education, right? Like we want it to the public. It's the public square. It has to be value neutral. But like yeah. education has to be pro. Pro-human, it has to be, and and like I, I connect the ancient Greek concept of paideia and philanthropia, which found expression in the in the Roman idea of humanitas, right? Like, uh, which in turn found expression in the concept of civility in the Renaissance in the Renaissance period of history, and this is the idea of education being the the purpose of which is to 
cultivate our humanity. It's to make good humans, to, to make us not just more fully human through exposing us to math, geometry, you know, rhetoric, poetry, philosophy, but also to make us more humane. It is to help us appreciate the gift of being human. Because as we appreciate the gift of being human in ourselves, we appreciate it in others too. It, it, it makes us more gentle, less savage, less cruel. We're less likely to dehumanize people if we are and have imprinted and modeled for us um, in, in, in the conduct of our parents and, and others in our lives, the high gift of personhood and, and being human. Well, you have a newsletter, The Civic Renaissance. It reaches nearly 50,000 subscribers. I'm sure some of our listeners would like to subscribe. So it's the best way of uh, keeping up with you, uh, you know, continuing to become more civilized humans ourselves. You know, how do we how do we sign up? Join us, please. It's um it's absolutely free. It's called Civic uh, civic renaissance civic-renaissance.com or just google it and it's a newsletter and intellectual community dedicated to beauty goodness and truth and reviving the wisdom of the past to help us lead better lives today and i uh for everyone who signs up i'm giving away a free greek mythology in 10 minutes course a crash course in these ideas and stories and figures that really pr provide the basis of the great conversation uh, this iterative dialogue across thoughtful people that um that can inform our 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 our, our world our, and our language and, and how we interact with others today. And it's also kind of a a, a crash course in the basics of ideas and and, and texts that I reference in, in the book as well. And so totally free course and being being part of Civic Renaissance, totally free and would love to. If you want a little bit more beauty, goodness, and truth in your life, um, please join us over there at Civic Renaissance and and um, continue learning with us. We'd love that. That's wonderful. And is there, are you on social media at all or? Um, all, there... all the platforms. Yeah. Twitter, um, Instagram, as much as I um, don't enjoy social media, I am there. So come, come over there with Kinda me too. You have to be and if you're an author, right? Exactly. Exactly. Well, Lexi, thanks so much for coming on the show. And of course, uh, we will be sharing some links out to purchase the book and give away some copies and do a lot of things to get this important work into our family's hands. And I encourage you to, you know, go to your favorite bookstore and and pick it up, or you can go to I guess one of the online giants too, probably. Um, no, do don't do the online giants. Go to your local bookstore. Ask the local. Better yet, ask your local bookstore to carry it and then buy it from them. They're a dying breed, and I love I love supporting local bookshops. They're like the really the hub, the lifeline of a community. So do support, do support them. Thank you. And I hear you can go to alexandraohudson.com forward slash civility. Thank you as well. If anyone chooses to buy the book, I have several hundred dollars worth of worth of gifts, in, including right. a toolkit, how to how to talk to anyone about anything, in including a course called um, Four Civility Books that will change your life. And th those are totally free. And so just go to alexandraohudson.com forward slash thank you and civility thank you. And you can claim those those free gifts um, there to help enhance. Um, your role in this joint project of living well together that I hope the the book fosters. All right. Well, thank you so much again. Uh, enjoy your book tour. We love uh, seeing all the social media updates and hearing your interviews. And uh, hopefully you will change the world and make it a better place. Rob, I'm so glad to be a partner with you in this in this important work of civic and cultural and intellectual revival. So thanks for all you do as well. I really loved how Lexi talked about education being a lifestyle and how her mom really helped her develop curiosity and how she's starting to homeschool her little kids and how she doesn't want to be put in a box. I think that just resonates so well with that flourishing life, with the idea of helping ourselves and our family become the best that uh, God has for them and not being put down in that bureaucracy that uh, really isn't designed around the ideas of searching for truth, beauty, and goodness in our lives. So if you enjoyed this episode, uh, please share it with a friend and be sure to check us out on YouTube uh, and uh, share that and comment and like and let us know what you think. So until next time, have a great day. Thank you for listening to Refining Rhetoric with Robert Bordens. Want more? Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss an episode. You can also follow us on social media to continue the conversation and visit classicalconversations.com forward slash rhetoric to find out how you can join a local homeschool community.